Welcome to Happy Talks with Dr. Alice and Donovan. Dr. Alice Fong is a holistic, naturopathic doctor and founder of Amorta Swa Wellness. And Donovan Jensen is a software engineer and founder of HowToHappy.com. Together, they're out to cause more happiness in the world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Happy Talks. My name is Dr. Alice, and here's my amazing co-host, Donovan. And today I have a very special guest. Lisa Skinner is a behavior specialist with an expertise in dementia, and she is the author of the award-winning and two times best-selling book, Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. Please welcome Lisa. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Alice. Hi, Donovan. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, what's what's the story that kind of led you to work with people with dementia and Alzheimer's? Well, when I was in college, I took a class on human behavior, and I just became absolutely fascinated by the day to day um, behaviors that human beings display. And I decided I wanted to make a, a profession out of it, a career out of uh, working with, um, with people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's distinct behaviors that happen within organizational settings and group settings and social settings. Um, how I ended up being a behavior specialist for people with Alzheimer's disease and um, other brain diseases that cause dementia was actually kind of by accident. But um, I did have my first experience with a family member with dementia when I was in my teens. And since then, I have had eight of my own family members mm. succumb to uh, a brain disease that causes dementia. Mm -hmm. It's a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. I have walked in the same shoes that so many of the family members that I've helped and counseled over the years have. So I kind of have that, that um, two-sided vision where I know what they're going through. And then because of the expertise um, that I've developed, over the years working in the elder care industry and with people with dementia, I can help them um, have an easier time of it. It is a very long disease to, to go through with a loved one. The average time somebody has it is eight to 15 years. My grandmother, actually, she was more of a 20 year person from the onset of her symptoms until her passing. Uh, and it's such a complex, complicated illness that I think um, what I discovered over the years is if people have a little bit better understanding of what's happening mm -hmm. to a loved one as a result of the damage being done to the brain, they'll have a much easier time going through the journey with them and have a much better relationship with their loved ones. So that's kind of um, where I'm at these days is really wanting to raise awareness mm. to people who are going through this so they can have a, a better quality relationship with their loved one, whether they're a family member or a caregiver. It works for, um, you know, for anybody involved with somebody who knows somebody or has a loved one with dementia. Yeah, it's a really interesting set of, and I'm sure it's challenging on everybody who goes through it, both the people actually experiencing it and, and their loved ones around them. I wanted to hone in a little bit more on some of the nuances here because maybe not everyone has experience, right? It kind of sounded like dementia is an outcome that can be caused by Alzheimer's or other things, but I would love to hear uh, kind of your take on it and what some of the differences are in, in, in that realm. Yeah, certainly. Uh, actually, dementia is not a separate illness. And a lot of people are um, kind of under the misconception that it is a separate illness. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had people say, oh, yeah, my, my dad doesn't have Alzheimer's disease. He has dementia. So let mm -hmm. me clarify that because I think it's really an important Thing for people to understand. So you have brain diseases, mm 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Alzheimer's is the most common brain disease Mm -hmm. that we're all very familiar with, but there are actually over a hundred brain diseases that cause dementia. So Mm -hmm. dementia actually is used as a broad term that describes the symptoms that are caused by one of these brain diseases. Parkinson's disease is one of them. Mm -hmm. Now, Parkinson's disease, that's kind of an interesting one because people can have it with dementia or without dementia. Mm -hmm. Well, Jay Fox is a perfect example Mm -hmm. of a person who's been living with Parkinson's disease for the last several decades, but he doesn't have the dementia. He's just as, you know, lucid and um, as, you know, most of us but he has the neurological piece of it, the shaking and that. So I've seen many, many people with Parkinson's disease that actually develop the dementia along with it. And then they have the cognitive dysfunction that goes along with dementia. So just to kind of put it in a better perspective for people to kind of wrap their heads around it. um, I'm going to use the flu as an example, because almost all of us have had the flu. Mm-hmm. at some point in our life. And sometimes we get it every year. And how do we know we have it? Mm-hmm. Symptoms that show up, mm-hmm. but we don't all display the same symptoms. Some of us get fever. Some of us get body aches and chills and tummy problems. Well, those are symptoms that alert us to, oh, we're sick. This feels and looks like the flu. Mm-hmm. But, you know, people can vary in their symptomology when they have the flu, not no two people are exactly the same. This is the exact same situation as dementia. You can mm-hmm. line up a hundred people with a brain disease who have dementia and they're all showing completely different symptoms. Mm-hmm. So they vary um, substantially between people but it's a term that's used to describe those symptoms that show up and um, accompany a brain disease as, and the other reason why it's so different is because depending on the type of brain disease, different parts of the brain are being damaged. And then you have people with mixed dementia. So they Mm -hmm. have a couple different brain diseases going on at the same time. That's actually not that uncommon. Mm -hmm. So when we say dementia, we're really talking about the symptoms that accompany a brain disease. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah, Yeah, I think that helps describe it a little bit better. Just for some, even even one more layer of clarity, could you give maybe just a couple of examples of of symptoms that would fall under that umbrella of dementia? Because it sounds like it can cover a whole bunch of things. Uh, And I think a couple examples would really help drive it home. Oh, Sure. Um, Yeah, there are actually many, many aspects of dementia that people aren't even aware exist, let Mm -hmm. alone associate with Mm -hmm. dementia. Most people um, associate dementia with memory loss and and confusion. Mm -hmm. So there's so many more layers to it than that. And again, um, depending on what type of brain disease the person has and what um, parts of the brain are being damaged will determine the behaviors that surface. So I'm I'm going to kind of stick more to Alzheimer's disease because it is the most common. It's the one that people are most familiar with. And Mm -hmm. it's really the one where the hallmark of the um, symptoms are memory loss Mm -hmm. and confusion, but there are so many other behaviors that also accompany uh, people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So some of the more common ones are um, hallucinations, Mm. illusions, um, emotional outbursts, Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things, there's a lot of behaviors and one of the things that uh, people, I guess, don't really understand about it. And this is kind of where I come in for them to help them understand and then to provide tools to help them um, have better ways to communicate and um, 
react and respond to these behaviors. Keep in mind when we see these behaviors, our loved ones are not intentionally trying to be difficult or mean or um, hurtful in any way. Mm -hmm. They lose their ability to articulate their needs to us, especially mm -hmm. at in the middle to end stages. These mm -hmm. behaviors are their way of trying to tell us that they need something or want something. So really what we're doing here is we're learning, we're having to learn a new way to communicate with people with dementia or Alzheimer's disease because they don't know how to tell us anymore. Mm -hmm. So the communication surfaces in, in the, the way of these behaviors. And so one of the things that we need to do is decode the behaviors. Mm -hmm. We we'll almost become like a detective. Mm. We have to recognize the behaviors, decode the behaviors, and then through process of elimination, try to figure out what the particular behavior means at that particular time. And it is very complicated, complex, and very layered but it is not, um, once you kind of understand it and learn it, it's easy to detect and decode and then uh, understand the most effective way to respond. So let me give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Um, one of the things that I've heard from clients over the last 25 plus years from adult children is how hurtful it is to them when they go to visit their mother or their father, or their loved one with dementia. And all of a sudden on that visit, the parent, the loved one doesn't recognize them. They don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. And this is a very common occurrence. And mm -hmm. I've had so many people over the years tell me how much it hurts them that their mother or their father has gotten to the point where they don't even recognize them. So just to help people understand what's happening, now I'm referring to Alzheimer's disease with dementia. Mm -hmm. Again, the hallmark of that disease is memory loss, confusion are the two most common um, situations. But what happens to the short-term memory? We have our short-term memory and we have our long-term memory. Mm -hmm. And you have Alzheimer's disease, the very first part of the brain that begins to damage is the short-term memory. Mm. As the disease progresses through the various stages, in the beginning of the disease, your short-term memory is pretty much intact. So our loved ones seem fairly normal. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, most people with Alzheimer's disease aren't even the majority of people aren't even diagnosed until they're already into their mid stage, because the mm -hmm. symptoms are very subtle in the beginning of the disease. And it's really hard to determine whether or not it's just normal aging that we're seeing, or mm -hmm. if something more serious than that. By the time they get into their mid stage, then it becomes pretty obvious that this is not just a part of normal aging, but something much more serious going on. Mm -hmm. And that's usually when a diagnosis happens, but you're already in the mid stage. So by the time you're in the mid stage, that think of the, your short term memory as having a, a switch that flips on and flips off. By the time the people are in the end stage, that switch is off most of the time. In the beginning stages, it's on most of the time. Mm. Middle stages, this is the part of the disease where it's on sometimes and off sometimes, on sometimes and off sometimes. And, and there's no way to tell how long it's going to be on and how long it's going to be off. So a person can go visit their loved one and everything seems fine. They know who they are. And then all of a sudden they start calling them by a different name. They don't recognize them. Well, guess what? That switch just instantaneously got switched off like mm -hmm. a short circuit. 
because our long-term memory stay intact for the duration of the illness, once that short-term memory switch gets flipped off, the people start pulling from their long-term memory because that stays intact and they go back to a different time of their lives in reverse. Mm -hmm. And where people end up varies from person to person. My mother-in-law, I'll give you, she was one of my family members that had Alzheimer's disease. She had five children. By the time she got married and all was said and done, she had five children and they were all grown up and she developed Alzheimer's disease. And we would visit with her. And sometimes she would call my husband, who's was her sec second son by his first name, which is Roy. And then out of the blue, she would just start calling him Otto. Now Otto is her brother. And then she would start talking about the tennis tournament that they're about to play in with their opponents. Well, this is the entire reason why she wasn't able to recognize him as her son because when her short-term memory switch got flipped off, she reverted back to when she was about 12 or 13 years old and her brother was her doubles partner when they played tennis. And because in her mind, in her reality, she was just an adolescent, she hadn't gotten married yet, and she had no children, let alone five children. So this man in front of her couldn't possibly be her grown son. She, mm. she knew him from somewhere. She recognized him as being part of her world. But because in her mind, she was just a little teenager, this man must be her brother. Mm -hmm. She hadn't gotten married or had children yet. Now, I have seen people, when that short-term memory switch gets flipped off, they go back to some period in their life, and I've seen it all the way from childhood to maybe in their 30s, and everybody is different. So what I advise people to do is listen for the cues. So when my mother-in-law, Marianne, started calling my husband Otto and talking about the tennis tournament that they were playing in, those are cues that we um, were given to know what period of time she, her reality went back to. And we figured it out from there. Oh, she's thinking Roy is Otto because she's only 12 or 13 years old. Hmm. Um, one of the common things that we hear from people is um, I want to go home. I want to go home. Mm -hmm. That means something different to each person. If somebody's short-term memory switch gets flipped off and they've, re they've reverted back to like their childhood, they're looking for their parents. They're looking for the home that they live in with their parents. Mm -hmm. This is a very common um, request from people with Alzheimer's disease a lot of them, if they're like in a memory care facility or in a different environment, they'll say, I want to go home. I want to go home. Most people just assume they're talking about where they had just come from. Mm. Their home means, I want to go home means something different to every single person. Some people, and this is really fascinating, when they say they want to go home, they mean they want to go to heaven and go home and be with God. Mm -hmm. Some people want to go to their childhood home. Some people want to go to the home that they did just come from, but you have to listen. You want to, you really want to dig deeper and peel the, the layers off the onion by saying, well, tell me about the home that you want to go to and then let them describe it so you can start piecing together really what home are they talking about? Mm -hmm. And then you can join their reality by helping diffuse the situation and, and um, first of all, acknowledge them and then uh, let them know that you will work on getting them to that place. So uh, that's kind of an example of um, one of the behaviors that we regularly see is 
not recognize your loved one, saying you want to go home, um, being suspicious that people are breaking into your home or stealing your things. Um, they actually take their own things and they hide them and then they don't remember where they're hidden. So mm -hmm. in their reality, they just assume somebody else took their things and mm -hmm. that's another common behavior. There are so many of these kind of bizarre behaviors that we see with brain disease uh, that I ended up writing this book to illustrate the different behaviors that are common with the disease because a lot of people don't relate these behaviors to being part of the disease. They just think it's kind of two separate situations. And I've had a lot of family members say to me, I just don't know what to do with my mom or my dad anymore because they've just, they're crazy now. Well, this is not being crazy. <laughs> it's not mental illness. Mm -hmm. This damage being done to the brain and these uh, are really what's causing these behaviors to surface. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can really see how that can um, be difficult for someone watching their parent go through that and not knowing how to interact with that when especially I could see a lot of people taking it personally and just taking maybe offense or that hurt you described. Um, but kind of how you described it, I was like, wow, I can't even imagine how difficult it must be to just like have a different reality open up and then all these people are telling you this other thing that's the real truth but you you it's just like you woke up and it's almost like a um time traveling <laughs> kind of experience it sounds like and it's just well, like wow if you woke up in when I was like 14 that would be and I believe that that would be really stressful I would imagine to like have people tell you that's not really what's going on Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, it, it doesn't really matter what anybody says or does to try mm -hmm. to, to kind of bring them back into our reality. Mm -hmm. Once that switch gets flipped off and wherever they are in their reality, yeah, they believe and there's no change in their mind until hopefully that switch, uh, the short-term memory switch gets flipped back on and then they're back into our reality. So mm -hmm. the difference is, is our realities, when this happens, mm -hmm. the difference is, is they're not synchronized. Mm -hmm. When that switch is on and their short-term memory is, is actively working mm -hmm. can tell you, you know, what they had for breakfast that morning, our realities are synchronized. So mm -hmm. everything makes sense to each party. Right. But when that switch gets flipped off, Mm -hmm. Their realities are not synchronized anymore. They're in one and we're still in the current one. Mm -hmm. And we just need to learn to adapt our reality to theirs mm -hmm. while it's happening. Mm -hmm. So let me give you another example because yeah. this is another common situation. And this, again, this happened to me with my mother-in-law, but I've seen it with so many people that have Alzheimer's disease but I'll tell you my personal one because it's kind of cute. So um, my mother-in-law, of course, had Alzheimer's disease and she had it probably for about 15 years. And my sister-in-law was her primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. so the other um, siblings, we all would take turns on weekends taking care of my mother-in-law to give Alice a break. Mm -hmm. And so she would come over to our house and this one particular Sunday, she was visiting with us and we were watching a program on TV and everything seemed normal. And then all of a sudden she jumped out of her seat and said, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I've got to get home. Take me home, take me home. Marty is at home waiting for me and I've got to get home to fix him dinner. He's going to be really upset if I don't get home to fix him dinner. Well, Marty was my father-in-law. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is he had passed away five years earlier. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, that short-term memory switch got flipped off just in a second while she was sitting there. And in her mind, she believed that her husband was still alive and well and sitting at home waiting for her to come and fix him dinner. Well, because I've been trained in this and educated in this, I 
took that as a cue. Okay, that that switch just got flipped off. She believes her husband is alive and well, sitting at home, waiting for his dinner. So I said to her, and this is what I mean, but when I say this, you need to join their reality. It's a term mm -hmm. that we use. Mm -hmm. It's actually a proven strategy. Um, so I said to her, oh, Marianne, it's okay. Marty just called and he knows you're here. He knows you're having a really nice visit with us. And I told him that I would bring you home very shortly. And he said, that's fine. Tell her to stay as long as she wants. We'll just um, have dinner when she gets here. And I told her this and she said, are you sure? Are you sure? He's okay if I stay a little longer? I said, oh, he's totally fine with it. Now, can you imagine what would have happened if I had said to her, mom, don't you remember dad died five years ago? What are you talking about? In her mind, he be alive. Yeah. It could have been like she was hearing that he had passed away for the very first time and didn't even know it. Nobody told her. Mm -hmm. so you really have to be careful how mm -hmm. you respond to these things. Because mm -hmm. in her reality, he was at home waiting for her. So this is, this is why we use join their reality because like I said a few minutes ago, there was absolutely nothing I could have said or done to convince her that he wasn't at home waiting. That's what she truly honestly believed. So it's much kinder to go along and join their reality than mm -hmm. trying to uh, bring them back into ours. I guarantee you it doesn't work and it can cause a lot of stress and um, you know, the situation can escalate into a much more serious situation. Mm -hmm. so, um, that's kind of how we train people to respond. But our it's counterintuitive because our natural response would be, what are you talking about? Marty's been gone for five years. Don't you remember? They don't remember. Mm -hmm. Their short term, that part of their short term memory just kind of short circuited. And it, where, wherever she was in, now this time she wasn't a 14 year old. She was back in a time where Marty was still very much alive and part of her life, mm -hmm. but she was older. She just was in a different, she just kind of ended up in a, it's like a portal. Like you said, <laughs> now this is like a portal in time. Mm -hmm. and you don't know which portal they're going to end up going through when this situation occurs. Mm -hmm. Do you find like the children ever, I totally understand it makes sense for them to join their reality because obviously you're not going to change the reality of the person That's right. with dementia or Alzheimer's, but do you feel like they, they resist because it feels like it's lying? Yes. Um, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. They do. Um, I hear that. I've been hearing that for years and years and years and what they do really have to understand is it's being much kinder mm. to their loved one because you cannot change their reality you can't then bring them back into mm -hmm. wars yeah so uh that's why the and you know and and studies have proven this that mm. but you know we've been doing the same thing to our children with santa claus and and the Easter bunny and the tooth fairy joining their reality. And then once they're at a certain age, it's like, oh, that just changes. So we've, we've all been doing it anyway. And it seems to be acceptable in that situation. So it's really the, the only approach that's effective and doesn't do more harm than good. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, because um, I was thinking the exact same thing is if some people would push back on, on it not being the whole truth and whatnot. But I think if, if you really focus in on what is going to provide the best outcomes, given the options that you actually have, because I imagine no matter how many times, no matter how forcefully or whatever else you try to bring them back into your reality, it's not ever going to work. It's That's only correct. going to make things escalate. So uh you know, it becomes this, this matter of like choosing 
which path is going to, to end up uh, work better. And I would hope that most people, if they take a step back and actually think about it for a while, you know, the path where maybe these things aren't hundred percent true, but it's going to be much more pleasant for your, for yourself and for them um, is ultimately, it makes sense that that would be the path worth walking. And I think it really uh, helps bolster that case with the idea that there's been some research behind it and shows that it's actually what's effective. It's not just something that you kind of do to, to, uh, you know, try to make them feel better or whatnot. It's one of the paths that actually works and is effective. And I think um, that's the whole point and why it's so critical to understand this whole concept of what's happening to the short-term memory and why I use the analogy of the, you know, the switch being flipped on and flipped off. Because if you listen for the cues based on what they're talking about at any given moment, you're going to know if it's on or off. And then you can go along with whatever their reality happens to be at that given moment. And really what you're doing is avoiding an even more serious situation. So if people can think of it in those terms, then I think it's a lot easier to um, grasp this joining their reality strategy and see why it's really kind of the necessary approach and the effective approach because um, the short-term memory isn't working at that moment. Mm -hmm in the same reality as we are. They're not synchronized. They're in uh, an alternate reality than we are. So if, if people can kind of wrap their heads more around that whole um, concept, then I think it's easier to accept and easier to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important the way that you've kind of outlined it as, as sort of a, a mechanical issue, right? It's, it's part of the way that, that their brain is... Uh, working or not working in this case, because I think, you know, we're all used to kind of having minor pieces of our reality out of sync with other people. And the, there are, there are a number of methods for getting us back in sync. But when the, when the problem is at like, you know, sort of this mechanical level and it's not, we're not going to sync them back into our reality. Um, I just think that that framing with like the light switch and stuff and, and understanding that short-term memory is not working as opposed to what, we normally do, which is, hey, that's how you think it is, but it's not, right? Like if it's just us talking and we have some sort of missynchronization, we can kind of talk through it and sort it out and use our short-term memory to actually get ourselves both into a place that works. But um, for these for these folks that uh, have some of these other things going on, we're not ever going to be able to use those same strategies to resync. I really like the way you said that, Donovan, that um, the way you just kind of emphasize that you're finding a place that works for both people. Mm -hmm. And this is what we have found works. Mm -hmm. And the main, the main point of all of this is it enables the parties to have a higher quality relationship with one another during the time that they're all kind of going through this journey together. Mm -hmm. It's not only difficult for the person who has Alzheimer's disease, but it is extremely difficult, especially mm -hmm. for the period of time that, that they go through it, to have a good quality relationship with somebody that, you know, you never know what, what's going to come out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. they, they lose so many other parts of um, their abilities, their cognitive abilities, they lose their ability to reason and use judgment for things. And um, they lose the eventually lose their ability to task sequence. Like, you know, we all kind of just take for granted that we know how to brush our teeth in the morning, we know how to dress ourselves, and we know how to drive a car, but there's a sequence of tasks that we perform to achieve these these activities you lose that ability so when you have um alzheimer's disease and dementia you don't you sometimes you get to the point where you wouldn't even recognize what to do with a toothbrush let alone 
the, the order of sequence that it takes to take the toothbrush out of the holder, run it under the water, put the toothpaste on, start, you know, that's a whole sequence of tasks to start and complete that activity. People with Alzheimer's disease lose the ability to do that. Mm. So it's really hard for loved ones to mm. not only help or care for them, but also to have patience and understand that this is all part of what's happening to them as a result of the disease. Mm -hmm. Eventually they need help with everything. Mm -hmm. What would you say for the, the loved ones that have someone they love with dementia or Alzheimer's, like how to deal with those, those difficult emotions that, and losing like almost like having their parent there, but not really there. Um, like what, what do you suggest or do you have any coping strategies for, for their, the challenges that they have to go through? Yeah. Um, and I ran a support group um, for three years, right up until COVID. And then you couldn't, weren't allowed to go into the care facilities anymore. Mm -hmm. So I haven't done it this past year, but that was one of the the subjects that we talked about a lot in my support groups, because when you think about it, you're actually losing your loved one twice. Yeah. You're losing who Perfect. they, who you, you once knew mm -hmm. because that person is completely changing Yeah, in every which way. And then they finally pass away. So mm -hmm. a lot of people really have to go through the grieving process twice, but mm -hmm. the the parent or the loved one is still alive, they don't realize that they are grieving and then they are going through um, their first loss. Because mm -hmm. everybody thinks you got to pass away before you actually have the loss. No, you're losing your person twice. Wow. So I think the best piece of advice is every time somebody starts feeling frustrated or feeling impatient with their loved one, mm -hmm. stop and remind yourself that this is the disease you're seeing. This is all part of the disease. Yeah. And you just really have to learn to recognize all the different layers that go along with this disease and that your loved one is not doing any of these things intentionally, that everything you're, you're feeling and you're seeing and you're witnessing is part of the damage being done to the brain. Mm -hmm. Even with Alzheimer's disease, most of the damage is to the short-term memory, but there are other layers of um, the disease that can also cause damage to other parts of the brain. So this is why you see multiple examples of different types of behaviors, because it all depends on what part of the disease is being effective. Um, the, 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 the outbursts, the, the loss of reasoning and judgment, that's usually the frontotemporal lobe area of the brain. So if you see those type of things happening, then you know that that's being affected. That part of the brain's being defected. I mean, affected. Mm -hmm. Wow, this has been a really insightful um, interview. And I'm sure that a lot of people who have, I mean, it touches everyone in some capacities to some degree um, at some point in their life. So I think this is really beneficial for those people to understand the disease itself and to understand that it is a disease, that they can't help it. Um, that being said, before we wrap up today, is there anything you would like to plug? Oh, well, um, we mentioned that I, I did write a book on the subject. So if anybody's interested in getting a hold of the book, um, the book really focuses on the behaviors, the common behaviors that surface as a result of um, having a brain disease, and then what to do about it. So that might be really helpful in helping you have a, a, a higher quality relationship with your loved one. I also have, oh, and it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. 
I also offer a blog. It's the same name as the book. It's on Facebook. It's called Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. And you have um, access to that. And I post a lot of information and tips and things that help other families go through this and have a, a resource available for them to tap into. So um, hopefully that's helpful to a lot of people as they're going through this journey, because it's a very, very difficult um, situation. And being a caregiver for somebody mm -hmm. with Alzheimer's disease is probably the hardest job anybody would ever have to do. So um, if, if any of the things that they can, um, you know, read on my blog or in the book that helps them have um, an easier time of it, then I'm hoping that that's what my information will provide for them. Beautiful. Yes. I, I think it will make a huge difference and impact because it sounds like such a, a heartbreaking disease and difficult for any caretaker or just to see your loved one with dementia or Alzheimer's. And so, I've had so yeah. many people mm -hmm. over the years tell me how difficult it is to find information on these mm -hmm. day, day challenges. Yeah. Oh, so that's the hard part is the day-to-day -day things, not the diagnosis. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the in-between and the day-to-day -day situations that arise. So, yeah, definitely. I'll go grab Lisa's book, Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. It's on Amazon and she has that Facebook group where you can get more tools and strategies. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please take a second to subscribe as it really helps out a lot. If you're looking for more content, there's all sorts of information over at howtohappy.com. And if you want something a little bit more condensed and concise, I've also written the book Mindscaping, which is essentially a framework for optimizing happiness. So we'll have the link there as well. And that's all I've got. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.